did you know about your character Walt Disney going into this project and uh, what were some new things you learned? I had read a, a great uh, biography of him uh, literally in the 1970s, <laughs> a book I checked out from the New York Public Library uh, when I lived in New York and um, needed something to do because <laughs> I was unemployed. Um, and I, so I had a, 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 a pretty good knowledge of the history of, of him in the early days um, uh, and the struggles that he had financing his, the earlier part of his career, which is actually really quite fascinating and, and, and oddly enough figured uh, in, in, this, in, in Saving Mr. Banks in the particular moment where he is throwing up his hands and saying, you know, I know how Pamela Travers feels. They once wanted, they once wanted to take the mouse away from me. I remember that story. Um, everything else from Walt Disney came from the own affection that I had as a kid watching him on TV every, uh, every Sunday night. It was a big deal when Walt Disney, on the Walt Disney Sunday night TV show, talked about the new ride or the new attraction that was coming up in Disneyland. That was, that was, that was the greatest, <clears throat> that was the greatest hour of television because here was describing something that if we were very, very lucky, we might get to go visit one of these days. It was absolutely magical. Uh, the things I, <clears throat> when I, what I, what I found out in the course of all the other research that I was able to do, thanks to Diane Disney Miller and the, and the Family Museum, <clears throat> is is understanding where he was at the time that uh, uh, Mary Poppins was made. He was really at the absolute pinnacle of, uh, of his, what's the word? I ought to call it a, a career, but you know he had already created the art form of the feature animated film and uh, he had invented Disneyland and uh, uh, he was that odd uh, and fascinating combination of artist and industrialist and, uh, and businessman and dreamer uh, that meant that he had the luxury at this time of truly just falling in love with the projects that he wanted to make. I mean he had payrolls he had to he had to meet and what have you, but at this point he had he learned how to make his dreams a reality. If it was just him drawing on a piece of paper and coming up with a talking mouse, or uh, figuring out how to make a giant squid attack a submarine in twenty thousand leagues under the sea, or how to build a fake castle in Anaheim, California, he had learned how to do all that. And so uh, by the time he ran smack dab into the uh, uh, the persnickety uh, woman who didn't care about any of those accomplishments, uh, I, he was. He was taken aback. And I didn't realize that he was his throne uh, by uh, Pamela Travers and uh, his quest in order to make Mary Poppins as he was. Was there a particular element of Walt Disney's personality that was difficult for you to portray or one that was really easy for you to portray? Uh, the, it, it, there's no easy or difficult in trying to just to, to, to make somebody, particularly a real human being that's as recognizable as Walt Disney was, um, into something that, that comes out of my face. <laughs> you know, it's a, there's, there's nothing simple about it. There's, a, there's, a, there's literally grunt work. There's a very specific, almost mathematical process of learning the cadence and the pronunciation of his flat Midwestern uh, 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 vocabulary and, and almost a dialect. And I, I, I work with a woman named Jessica Drake who's helped me find the voice of a, quite a number of characters in other films. But um, there, there is the, the, however it translates to coming out of, you know, the, the, whatever specific countenance the actor offered, so that, that is some sort of serendipitous thing that you just have to have faith in uh, in order to pursue. It's not easy, uh, but when you get it, it's not hard, if that makes sense. You just do it and it's just there. Did you have any favorite scene in the movie, and if so, why? Uh, I loved the, uh, the, the, the big highlights of it are um, the first meeting, you know, going hand-to-hand -hand combat with, uh, with Emma as, as Pamela, which was one of the great attractions to doing it in the, in the first place. There was a substantial story at, at the end of the film uh, in, which you, in which we were able to pepper uh, with so much authenticity and so much true biological um, uh, background that you find out stuff about Walt Disney that no one would ever known unless they had done a substantial amount of research. But I have to say my absolute favorite scene to shoot was recreating a moment from Walt Disney's <laughs> Wide Wonderful World. I got to be Walt Disney talking to Tinkerbell at the beginning of one of those television shows 
And that was an absolute dream come true. That was just a blast. Touching on something you said about uh, the casting of Emma before and working with her as P.L. Travers, how important was it that you were working with someone of such a high caliber to uh, opposite your Walt Disney? Well, I, I was in the lucky position just to join after Emma was already established. And I had known Emma very, very well socially through, you know, for the last 10 years or so. And we had had a fabulous conversations, a lot of great dinners, uh, both in the United States and, uh, and in the U.K., uh, and working with her, I knew, I said, look, well, there's, there's nobody that's more of a professional than Emma is, and there's nobody who understands how to take a scripted word, because she's a writer herself, and, and perform it uh, in a film. So knowing that she was going to be as thoroughly in the moment and prepared as she was, well, that just raised my game. I really had to make sure that I, that I, that I knew what I was going to be. It's intimidating. You know, it's no lie, intimidating with working with someone that you really like, as well as someone who you truly admire and someone who is as facile at the, you know, at the craft of uh, acting on screen as, as Emma did. So I think we were both, I mean, we loved it. I mean, there was, but there were, the, the give and take that we shared was all about in the dialogue. It wasn't like a lot of goofing around or getting to know each other in the course of making the scene. And I think we gave John Lee Hancock probably 40% more usable footage just because we were so specific of what, uh, what we were each doing. It's a very complex relationship that Walt Disney has with uh, Mary Poppins author P.L. Travers. How would you describe that relationship and talk a little bit about the immovable object that Pamela Travers was to Walt Disney? Pamela Travers hated Walt Disney, and she hated America, and she hated movies, and she hated cartoons, and she hated that she had to give up this creation of hers over to some sort of like uh, commercial buffoonery that, uh, that she felt Mary Poppins was from the get-go. Now. Some of that is absolute bluster. Some of that is just insecurity working itself out. Walt Disney uh, was not used to coming across someone like that who did not succumb to his charms. He was a beloved guy. He, Salvador Dali and Picasso hung out with Walt Disney. He was, he was, he was world renowned for being a, a, a great artist and to, have a, and to have to fight for the rights to this uh, the, her, the story of the books of Mary Poppins for as long as he did, I think he felt as though, well, he had won. And it turned out he was just at the beginning of a process that he almost lost because she maintained uh, the script approval. Uh, how that happened is beyond me. I think that was a, you know, a, a, an acquiesce on, on Roy Disney and Walt Disney's parts just in order to be able to move forward with the movie. But uh, uh, he was, I, I think he was completely flummoxed by a woman, a, a force of nature who just continuously said no, when I think Walt Disney would accept no maybe three times, but then after that, yes, always seemed to fall in place, and it just did not happen with Pamela Travers. And uh, the, at, at one point, he, you know, I think he agreed to things he never would have agreed to, and he also just sort of like gave this hopeful order to his staff of uh, fix this. <laughs> and I don't think he ever had to do that before. Were there any particular materials from the museum, the Disney Museum, or the archives that helped inform your character, and how did you use those to help you? Well, there was, it's mostly you just keep stacking up this information of this anecdotal story that goes on and on and on, and, and the stuff that really quite helped was, uh, um, there, there's plenty of physical things that he did. He did sign his own cards and hand them out. Uh, um, he did. Uh, 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 he did spend a lot of time uh, at the office, uh, but it was his home, and his kids were on weekends. His daughters would be out riding their bikes all over the back lot. Uh, but then you talk to somebody like Richard Sherman, who worked day in and day out with him. Rich, Richard gave uh, gave a magnificent um, anecdote that immediately made it into the movie, which was that his his lack of high praise. If if Walt Disney liked what you did. He didn't go on and on, oh, that's great, that's perfect, that's exactly what I want, you guys knocked me out, way to go, this is absolutely perfect, bravo, he didn't say that. He would say, hmm, that'll work, that's what he said, that was the highest praise that you could get from Walt Disney in the room. And it's in the movie because we, we heard it from the source. Great, thank you very much. You